Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, maybe even good evening to some of you. Um, this is the HR Executive Webinar for Modern Mobility, the New Rules of Succession Planning. So if that's where you expected to be, you're in the right place because that's where this plane is going. I'm excited to be here today. Um, looking forward to walking you through our materials. Um, here's our agenda for the session, um, and I'm excited to be joined by Maria Howard. Um, so first, I'd like to just introduce myself really quickly. Um, again, Jason Serrato, I'm a Senior Director of Product Marketing uh, for Eightfold.ai. Um, we are a talent intelligence platform that provides solutions for talent acquisition, talent management, um, contingent workers, as well as talent insights um, for marketplace analysis. Um, I am on the product marketing team and cover the talent management side of the house. Um, in a former life, I was an industry analyst um, working for Gartner. And even before that, uh, a former HR executive leading talent acquisition and leadership development programs. So the topics of succession planning and internal mobility are near and dear to my heart. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce Maria and have her uh, explain and introduce herself as well. Thank you, Jason. And it's great to be with all of you. I'm Maria Howard. I'm a partner and general manager for Hydric Digital. Uh, I've spent nearly 20 years in the leadership and talent space as a practitioner, as a business leader, and really over the last 10 years focused on building digital businesses. And I do remember, and it, it was nearly 20 years ago, uh, asking some colleagues about succession planning. What, what is this and how does it work? And I remember somebody handing me a nine box and said, this is how it works. And I thought that was pretty darn magical, that this was the math that charted people's futures in an organization. And I still to this day have that original nine box from all those years ago. But what I'm excited to discuss with all of you today is how we can transform that map into modern mobility. So I look forward to the conversation. So with that, oh, we're so excited to have you all with us. I'll walk you through a quick agenda. We plan to talk about some of the environmental conditions that are impacting your talent strategy today as well as what leadership for the future um, looks like and how it's top of mind for HR and that it will be very different from what we're working with today, as well as increasing visibility to identify leadership in organizations. So with that, um, let's start the show. So the biggest threat to succession planning is uncertainty. Matter of fact, you know, the biggest threat to any type of planning is uncertainty. And organizations are faced with uncertainty today in every direction. We have a war going on in the world. We're still trying to come out of this pandemic. There's the economy for good and bad. If you work in talent, you probably are familiar with hurry up and stop. You know, we're, we're going through that every day. Um, we've been going through digital transformation, and now we have organizational transformation on the other side of that. We're also working through hybrid and remote work, um, as well as trying to wrap our arms around kind of the recency of these in-demand skills that we're all trying to recruit for and develop while at the same time facing head-on the shortened shelf life of existing skills in our organization. So it's a very turbulent time uh, for leadership. It's a very turbulent time for HR, but I'm not telling you anything that you probably don't already know. The, the, the difference here is that we've always been faced with uncertainty. You know, when I was working in HR and I was an HR leader, it kind of became a running joke. We would use this phrase, you know, next year is going to be a bad year. Because as we were trying to plan ahead, we were always planning for the worst, and we still couldn't plan for everything. You know, but today, the challenge is that we, fit, we face change that's coming faster um, with increased competition. Um, organizations are being disrupted as well as potentially choosing to disrupt themselves. And as a result, our methods of work are, are changing, our, our job mix uh, and our skill requirements are changing, and organizations themselves are increasingly pivoting into other areas or products or industries to remain competitive. So it's more complex than ever for organizations to predict what talent they will have, uh, what talent they will need in the future, and what that work will look like when, when they get there. Now, I know, Maria, you worked with several organizations on this front. How much of that rings true with you? All of it and then some, right? We could probably fill an entire day talking about this idea of uncertainty. And what struck me is, is when we're talking to business leaders across any industry in any part of the world, there's this very serious recognition that uncertainty is leading to more. More is at stake. More is being disrupted constantly. Uh, more is expected through that. Think of all of us over the last couple of years and how we've led and how we've had to show up 
in our lives. And more are demanding the access and influence they deserve. And because of that, we need more leadership across the boundaries that divide us. And so, Jason, when you talk about all of these influences that are creating uncertainty, to bring this to life, there was, this was last August, there was one week where there were significant announcements about demographic change or diversity requirements. There was landmark climate science that was released. There was regulatory change. There was shareholder action. There was cybercrime. And there was the emergence of companies that reshaped how we invested. And that was one week, right? One so week. when we talk about uncertainty, it's macro, it's micro, it's extra organizational forces, it's intra organizational forces. And, and all of this has impact on our people, on our ability to be successful, and importantly, how we serve our communities and our customers. And so if uncertainty means more, the question we've got to ask ourselves is, well, how does this change our priorities? Because I know no one wants another task, another thing added to their list. So, Jason, I'm curious, how does this change what we're focused on as, as leaders, as CHROs, as, as HR, who are really in charge of the people side of this equation? I think that's a great question to, to kick us off, and we're going to talk about that from a couple different perspectives, as, as, I, as I shared. We've been dealing with some of these challenges in the past. We haven't necessarily been faced with the pace of them, but I also, also think the other added nuance to this is what's going to get us out of these challenges and face these challenges head on will be very different from how we try to tackle these problems in the past. Now, just to kind of orient everyone to the session, um, we are going to try to make this interactive and we'll ask you some poll questions along the way. Um, when a poll pops up, you'll see it in the WebEx interface, and you'll have about 20 seconds to answer the question, so please you know, be close to your uh, buzzers and, and, click, and click and provide us your answers, and then we'll review that and include it in our discussion. And the other thing is, as we walk through this, we wanted to start kind of at the macro level and then bring it closer to home. So we wanted to start kind of with just what's happening in the world and then walk through kind of the organizational challenges, the, the leadership challenges, and then what that means for employees. So with that, as a former Gartner analyst, I often refer back to Gartner as a, a leading source of research, especially in the HR uh, space. Um, this is uh, a survey that went out to 572 HR executives by the Gartner HR uh, practice research team. And this talks about at the CHRO level, um, when they were surveyed, what were they highlighting as their strategic priorities for 2022? And when you think about this, we're looking at, you know, their top five, and you see, you know, highlights for future skills and leadership bench strength as being, you know, two of the top five strategic priorities. Um, but very close behind is future of work. And, you know, as I, as I just mentioned, if we were to look at a similar piece of research, maybe from 2016, 2007, maybe even, you know, the 1990s, maybe those top five would be rather similar. But the forces impacting these topics and the tools that may be required to address them and the pace of change and the pace of decision making is much different. So I think that's part of what um, we wanted to talk about today as, as we work through kind of the challenges at the organizational level. So one of the things that's definitely happening is, you know, as the problems may be similar, these, these solutions and the approaches are required of us to be increasingly different from what we've done in the past. You know, we have more data available to us. We have other tools that are helping us interpret that data or analyze that data. Um, we have tools such as AI. We have, you know, embedded analytics teams. Uh, we even have market intelligence. Um, but two of the things occur when you have all that information. Sometimes you have to deal with the managing of that data and how you make sense of it, but also you have to understand just the speed of interpreting that data to make decisions. And the other part about it is, I don't know about you, but in, in, in my scenarios, it's one of these things where it's almost as if the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. And I think that's why our approaches to these topics of planning and leadership development and building a business for the future have to increasingly be agile and dynamic. Now, I know, Maria, you have some examples from some of the folks that you work with. Um, can you provide just some commentary along those lines? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're absolutely right. We all know we need to be more agile. I mean, if I think agile might be the, the most you know, famous and popular word we've all used uh, in this space for the last probably 10 years. But when we look at it, right, the process that we use to select and to evaluate and replace leaders, it, it, it remains largely unchanged. 
and it's pretty closely controlled. And so given what you're talking about, um, let's put it in context this way. Research suggests that as many as 30 to 50% of companies who have no formal detailed succession plan in place for their CEO. Their CEO, right? So imagine what this means for all leaders, all employees. If we can't do this well at the CEO level, it's going to be a challenge, and it's certainly going to be a challenge to do it quickly, dynamically, and in an agile environment. The other piece we found is that 22% of HR leaders describe their companies as having industry-leading effectiveness at identifying and placing senior leaders. So we've got to find a way to get not only better at this, but to your point, do it in a, in a different way. Um, and, and I think what makes this considerably more challenging is not just what's going on externally, but when we look at all of our HR priorities. I mean, I, I, I think of the HR community as sort of the heroes of the last couple of years um, when we looked at the critical things that needed to happen. Um, companies went virtual in a matter of days when they may have had hybrid work on the horizon three years <laughs> down the road. Um, people's safety and health and wellness, right? So there's so much on our plates that um, how does this need to change and do it differently and do it better fit in with all of those priorities? And um, I, I know Eightfold, I think, did a survey about this. So I'm curious what you found in terms of the juggling um, of all of these things. Uh, yeah, so we just conducted uh, an HR survey, um, you know, just about a few weeks ago, and we did it at two levels, one at the leadership level and one at the employee level. Um, this is a slide that speaks to um, 259 HR executives, and it, it talks directly around all the different priorities they're trying to juggle. Um, and as you can see here, there's, you know, the focus on skill development and, and identifying leaders and and you know, transforming the way they analyze talent while also incorporating, you know, DE&I and democratizing the process and handling everything else that's on their plate. So, you know, as the nature of work has changed, where we work has changed, what we're working on has changed, you know, HR processes are still in demand, talent acquisition, talent management, compensation, development, um, but the way we need to approach them has been completely disrupted at the same time Increasing, in, increasingly co collaborative. So, you know, um, HR, HR teams are challenged with finding new ways to do things, and in most cases, it requires both changing processes, maybe forgetting what they've done and starting from scratch towards the future, but also, uh, you know, incorporating new tools. And, and again, here, you know, in this chart, you can see leadership development and training are key priorities, as well as analyzing data to inform decisions. Now, layer on that, trying to work in increasingly hybrid or remote work environments, or in some cases, people are returning to work. And what does that mean for the workforce? How does that change the workforce? How does that change management styles and visibility? So um, tumultuous time, um, a lot on HR's plate. Um, and I don't think uh, it's getting any easier. And like you said, the, the assumption is uncertainty means more, but part of it is also using data and using insights to, fo to understand what to focus on. Yeah. Well, the themes you talk about across retention and development, internal promotion, DE&I, it all fits into the broad spectrum of what succession planning is helping to enable, right? So I'd, I'd love to start, and this will be our first poll, start with all of you. Um, how often does your organization engage in succession planning? If all of these different processes kind of roll under that big umbrella, um, how often are you uh, focused on it? So if you can go ahead and fill out your poll questions, and then we'll share the results and see how similar or different we have um, across the group. The poll has ended. You have to move quick. <laughs> Okay, I think we're shutting it down and should see the results shortly. Okay, so it looks like 43% um, say it's an annual process, 24% um, say as needed, um, and then from there it goes biannually, quarterly. Um, so, I, you know, I'm not surprised, right? That for most of this, this is, this is an event. 
it's a time-driven process in our organization. And really that makes sense, right? Because what we often have today is a time-intensive and sometimes manual process. We have to prep leaders and managers on how we want to run talent reviews. We gather qualitative and quantitative data. We have the discussions. We finalize decisions. We communicate, sometimes not, to all of our employees about what we discuss. And then we have to roll this up to the CEO and board, right? So this can take months of work, and it takes a lot of people to get it done. You know, we recently talked to an organization about their spend on succession planning. And they said, you know, let's focus on our top 120 leaders. That's where we spend the majority of our succession planning efforts. And so we looked across costs, both the cost of people's time and also the actual spend on, you know, tools and technology content. So this ranges across HR resources, business leaders, participants, assessments, and technology, which interestingly, technology actually had the smallest spend. Um, and what we found is for the top 120 only, it totaled about $1.1 million for this annual process, similar to many of you. So that's expensive, and that doesn't scale. So what is the solution, right? How do we start moving from a critical process that has high cost in terms of time and resources to being able to deliver a modernized take on succession and mobility? And I would argue that we must first embark on the digital transformation of leadership, right? This means building from a data-driven approach. Jason, you talked a lot about that, and using technology to serve up leadership intelligence. We just can no longer have static data and spend all our time on gathering and analyzing, right? Technology can actually deliver this. You can now focus then on taking action proactively. I always think of, of tech and, and data as your insurance policy. As the standards for performance change, you've got to be ready. And the only way you can be ready is, is through this digital approach. And I think what that also means is it has to be always on, right? When we have growing uncertainty, it means a continuous approach. The, the piece of that poll that was hardest, that, that had the least <laughs> amount of responses, is, is what actually creates modern mobility. Because that's not an on again, off again. It's not about the near or short-term vacancies or replacement planning, right? Modern mobility's goal is to ensure the effective leadership and governance of the organization well into the future, whatever may come. So I'm sure this all sounds great, right? And, and we say focus on data and digital, and, and I would guess a lot of you would say, yeah, that, that would be fantastic, but let's break it down, right? How do we look at different data um, and digital approaches that can help us achieve this? So, so Jason, what are, what are you seeing in terms of how to transition that into, into what we can use data for? So a lot of organizations are as we talked about transformation and shifting their approach are increasingly looking at becoming skills driven organizations. So not as much of a focus on roles specifically, but also the skills that make up those roles and how work gets done and what skills orient to what work, what work. I think organizations increasingly need to use internal as well as external data points to kind of monitor and understand the skills that are needed as well as how the work is getting done and as a result also need to balance their organizational knowledge with visibility to market intelligence as well as declining and emerging skills you know and you know how organizations are attempting to manage these changing requirements is really hard to do manually or in a user driven way or even in a dynamic real time consistent way so one of, the, one of the tools that lends itself well to this, this kind of dynamic skilling approach, is artificial intelligence. Um, additionally, you know, when we talk about talent management processes and practices and we think about succession planning and leadership development, there's a lot of other things that come before those processes. But all of them are building up to the capability to have a, a, you know, a robust bench and a ready succession plan. So succession planning is, is a, a piece where while those 120 people that may be closest to the sun are of most interest to you or to your organization, there's a lot of other things happening below those 120 people that are going to set up the success of your succession plan, but also maybe where we need to spend more time focusing our attention to understand what's really happening in organizations and really transforming in the way work gets done. With that, um, 
you'll see here uh, my, hand, my, my, my trusty friends back at Gartner, you know, leadership roles are changing rapidly. Again, this came from, you know, the research out of, you know, HR leaders talking about some of the challenges they're, they're facing. You know, leadership roles are requiring an increasing set of responsibilities and skills, and they're pulling from a broader mix of skills and experience. Um, so the profile of leadership is getting broader um, and also changing. And the other part about it is, you know, most organizations are already anticipating the fact that, you know, more than 40% of their leadership roles will change significantly in less than five years. So if you're doing this on an annual basis, you only have a few cracks at it to really monitor what's happening, how it's changing, and who you have that aligns to those changes. So it really is, you know, uh, ever pressing challenge that get that you know we think of the future as this distant thing. It's the fast approaching future, with all the change and you know the dynamicism that's happening in the market. Yeah, I, I remember the the concept of the the war for talent, you know, from years and years ago, right? Um, we saw at, at that point it was often sparked by the demographic changes that were going to happen. Hey, if we've got boomers leaving the, the workforce and we don't have a large enough population or it means people will get bigger jobs sooner. So, so you're right, this has kind of been around for a while, but it's really coming to a point of urgency now. You know, when you talk about some of these um, statistics around roles changing and expectations changing, we've seen this in a couple of ways too. We, we have our annual route to the top study where we look at CEOs and what we saw was that more new CEOs have C-suite experience beyond the traditional roles you'd expect. CFO, COO. Now we're seeing CEOs emerge who were chief strategy officers, chief transformation officers, uh, maybe even a chief risk officer, and coming from technology and IT as well. So we've also seen this um, in terms of the number of new roles we're placing. Uh, in the year between the summer of 2020 and 2021, we saw that our placements of new roles in financial services firms rose from 41% to 59%. So you're right. It is here, it is now, it is happening. And it begs the question, how do we prepare people when we don't know exactly what they'll ask to be stepped in, uh, step into? And so how do we make them ready for anything <laughs> even we don't know what's coming? And we studied over 3,000 leaders during, during the COVID time period, and we had 30,000 different data points on how people led, what changed, right? What was their impact during that time? And from that, we identified four capabilities that were particularly critical for leaders of the future, meaning how can they continue to have impact even with a lot of uncertainty. And we, the, the, the four things we found are first that they need to lead through influence, right? We need to connect people, and we need to connect people to the organizational purpose. And that's incredibly um, grounded in being inclusive. Second, we've got to drive execution. We have to make tough decisions on really complex and novel challenges that benefit the whole ecosystem, our people, profits of an organization, and the planet. Third, we need to create new thinking, right? So how do we increase working in teams to yield new and different insights, which is another inclusive focused behavior. And finally, how do we have an ownership mindset? That will help us lead into the future. We take responsibility for successes and failures we're resilient, and we inspire trust and accountability. This is how we can make everyone more future ready, and so we need to develop this in all levels across all employees. And I would dare say that we also need to focus on skills, um, or excuse me, prioritize um, how we focus on roles that are driving the future growth of your organization. Differentiate your spend where the future is at stake. And this is hard because all matters, uh, all roles matter, um, and all roles contribute. But not all roles focus on what's next, right? And, and this has come up a lot. We've been, we've been working with a healthcare organization, and perhaps no industry has gone through more disruption over the last couple of years, and they're going through digital transformation. How can we provide healthcare that someone would get in a hospital or a facility in people's homes? And so they're building a function dedicated to solving this big challenge. They need to grow fast. They're trying to identify internal talent and external talent to, to really build out um, this part of the organization. But what we find, found that's happened is that the roles and the requirements, to your point, Jason, the skills that it takes are changing frequently because 
this isn't an easy or tidy business problem to solve, right? It changes and evolves as they work through innovative approaches. And so the risk they have is that if they don't continuously update what the requirements are, how they change, it, it puts attrition on the table. Um, people need to know what's being expected of them. And so we have to integrate the ability to define changing requirements that align to the business shifts before, during, and after transformation. It is not something that we can do once and then move on. And you really need a system to help you do this, right? So it's yet another opportunity to have a digital approach, drive the mobility you need, and break down these roles into their component parts so that you can best deploy talent to a problem versus deploy them to a job description and, and sort of the box that we, we can sometimes put people in, right? So, Jason, I, I think this gets us to our next poll, which is really trying to understand the type of technology um, you might be using today in succession planning, role planning, and all the things we just discovered. Uh, discussed. So if you want to go ahead and please put in your answer, the poll should be up and live. And um, I will just say, I don't know about you, Jason, but I do remember homegrown tools um, for me was Post-its <laughs> on whiteboards um, with boxes driven, uh, uh, drawn in different colors. So um, you know, I'll just share that, that I've had my share of homegrown tools uh, that I've used in the past. Me too. <laughs> I think, I think we've all been there. All right, if you want to finish up putting in your answer, we'll see the results. Okay. Well, we're, we're not alone. 28% of you said you've also used homegrown tools. I don't know if yours are post-its and markers or not, but um, the, the majority, actually 41% of responses said it's manual processes. So I, I think this is um, uh, consistent. Um, and then we do have some, about 20% who use HCM um, uh, tech. Uh, so it, again, majority are in the manual process, homemade tools. We've got a little bit of technology um, uh, showing there, but obviously this is the huge opportunity um, for all of us. I think the other piece of this is if you think about homegrown tools and manual processes, as a result of just the nature of some of those approaches, they limit how much information you can include or how much um, uh, ground you cover in the process, as well as kind of what the audience or the focus is. And in many cases, that may be strategic, like your example of you know, the top 120. But as we move forward and we talk about kind of where the market is headed and, and where this is shaping, it also potentially creates either blind spots or this kind of hole in the bucket effect where things may be happening before people get to those top 120, and you know they're not making it there when they could have. So um, when we talk about kind of the changes that are happening in leadership and, and what's going on with these tools, the incorporation of talent intelligence and AI is helping organizations manage all of this data. But if you think about it, you know, Maria, I heard you say, planning and investing in the jobs and focusing on the jobs that have the biggest impact for the future. Part of that requires, you know, not only using your own organizational data, but using some market intelligence and using some competitive analysis. Um, when you think about, you know, the, the, ch the changing nature of the leadership roles and that previous slide we had where it said, you know, 40% of organizations anticipate they will look very different in five years. You know, every year there's market research that's published for like the top 25 most in-demand roles or the top 25 you know, most hard to recruit for positions. When you look at those lists, you know, 10 to 15 of those jobs didn't exist 10 to 15 years ago. And the same thing is happening you know, at the leadership level. Just a few years ago, how many of us would have had a chief experience officer or a chief sustainability officer or a chief privacy officer, right? Uh, just this morning, I saw a chief listening officer. Right. So the, as much as the market is evolving and the workforce is evolving, the lead, leadership and the skills and the roles accountable for that are evolving. You know, one of the things I just wanted to add before we move on is we've heard a lot around kind of people moving, you know, in a, in a more of a lateral way in organizations. And part of this session is talking about, you know, modern mobility. And the focus of that is on developing kind of T-shaped careers where you may have 
you know, a significant depth in one specific area, but you also get exposure to a broader set of functions or, you know, operational roles to really balance out your expertise. Well, the same thing's happening with T-shaped leaders, like this, like the CEO example um, that that you shared. Right. So um, the next chart I wanted to share is just as we talked about potentially doing this deeper into the organization to try to understand how jobs are changing and how work is getting done, you know, this is from the Eightfold survey that we conducted um, where it just highlighted that organizations are struggling to offer career advancement opportunities to, to all employees. You know, as you can see here from the results, only 35% of the HR leader surveyed said they can, they're able to offer all employees the opportunity to pivot into new roles or areas within the organization, or only 34% offer all employees visibility into which skills employees currently have or how their, how their um, skills translate into different career paths. I think one of the things that has definitely occurred is the way work is getting done is much different from maybe how leaders did that work as they were becoming leaders. So part of this is getting down into the employee level and the organizational level helps inform kind of how the future leaders of tomorrow will have to be developed and how those roles will have to take shape. And it also informs how leaders have to manage. Um, you know, in HR, we've been burdened by data silos. You know, we've had all these pocket and pilot systems and pocket programs where we have data that sits in a variety of areas and we've been trying to break free from those data silos. Well, now the whole point of it is trying to, you know, overcome some management silos. As we get more collaborative teams and project teams that deploy towards work, you know, they're more cross-functional and they don't necessarily map to an org chart or to a management structure. And, you know, leaders have to be more collaborative. And I believe, you know, there was a phrase that may have come from Deloitte uh, a few years ago on this kind of symphonic C-suite of, you know, um, not having just a hold so tight on, on the view or on the management of the, of the function. It's now more of a collaborative workforce. The other thing was I was just talking with um, an HR leader the other day, and, and she was saying, you know, um, leaders of today and of tomorrow don't necessarily – have to have done it the way it's being done to lead it the way it's going to be done tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And it's a whole different way of manage, managing and, and kind of leadership style, but it also requires greater intelligence and, and um, analytics and analysis into the skills that are required and who's possible to be able to do those roles. You know, that's so interesting. It, it, what, what came to mind uh, hearing you talk about this, Jason, and, and sort of how we need to look at talent sort of more broadly, remove those silos. Um, I had a, a, a memorable moment uh, when I was getting started as a succession practitioner, and I was lucky enough to train with a succession guru, and he told me the story of the seven CEOs question. Um, and he, he talked about being in a room with a CEO and senior team and asked them, who are the next CEOs in your organization? And the answer was sort of what you'd expect, right? Um, various C-suite members or VP-level people. Um, but he said, no, that, that's not what I'm asking you. Who are the next C seven CEOs down in your organization? Go seven layers down. Do you know who they could be? And it was such a powerful question to highlight how important it is to take action, you know, in earlier stages of employees' growth, right? Or now that organizations are more flat or, to your point, T-shaped careers, how can we look in different places? But we cannot just look across the top. We have to be looking down so that we're prepared for the future, so that we're identifying who these people could be earlier, right? I, I talked to a, a leader who um, leads executive development um, at, a, uh, at a consumer corporation, and she said that the question that dogs me every night is, who has left that I just didn't even know about? Who have we lost that we would be so um, upset to know that we've lost but wasn't even on our radar? So to your point, we, we've got to break down the silos. We've got to make sure there's visibility. We've got to make sure there's more options. And we have to take accountability to go much further, much deeper into an organization. Um, and I, I do see a question came up. So I'll, I'll pause this for a second to make sure we, we get to that. Um, a really good question about how does this apply to smaller organizations, right? How can a company of 100 people implement some of these? Um, and, and Jason, maybe I'll kick it off to you, and then I'm happy to add any commentary, but I think that's critical because this, how we solve for this 
should not be limited to only large um, or certain sizes of organizations. So what are your thoughts, Jason, on, on how do we deploy these types of strategies in various sizes of organizations? So I think it's a great question, so thank you to the person who asked it. I think, you know, there's a couple elements to it. It's the incorporation of additional data and, and you know, moving beyond just what you know inside of your organization to understand what's happening in your in industry, what's happening with the competition, what's happening with the, the market for talent, to know how the jobs are changing and the jobs are shifting that feeds into this process. And that's important regardless of the size of an organization. From there, you know, you may not have seven levels deep in an organization with 100 people, but you can also encourage movement and mobility to move people around to start to encourage those type of T-shaped careers and, you know, variable work experiences. And as a result, you know, give people a chance at bat to allow for leadership to, to develop and surface at every level. And whether it's not maybe your next seven CEOs, maybe you know your next four. But at the end of the day, um, you know, HR is, is tasked with incorporating more data into these, um, uh, these processes, um, doing them more frequently, and not solely relying on their own data or who's in their immediate proximity or, you know, who do we know? It's now more who do we have and kind of democratizing the opportunity. Yeah, you know, something you said um, uh, made me think, I, so I've been at larger organizations, but I've also been um, at, at a small organization. We had about 70 people. Um, and what was really powerful, what, what that experience taught me, especially actually, I led a lot of the succession planning there, was because you um, have more access to see who's in your organization, right? It's, it's not as complex as 10,000 employees. There's a, a, a greater ability, I would say, to be on the forefront of an agile approach. Um, now, I think it's not just about who's known through one person's lens. So how do you start having teams work together where different people can get experience working with you know, others who sit outside their function or their, their core um, area? So I actually think smaller organizations can be the tip of the spear on this transformation. One, because you've got a, um, a smaller subset of people that you potentially have access to, knowledge of, and you can start integrating more easily. But two, there is a lot of um, technology available that can do this in a very um, streamlined way. So not everything has to be a big, massive implementation, right? I think that's often how we think about uh, technology and data. It's this huge thing to uncover. There's lots of amazing approaches um, where you are small. You can get the right pieces in to start, I will say that taking organizations through their own digital transformation when it comes to HR and people can be a massive uphill when they've got tons of existing um, processes and, and people and different data points and silos, right? And so when you're small, you can actually build a world-class way of doing this from the beginning because you probably don't have quite as much embedded already. So I actually think in some ways it can give you a bit of an advantage. I'll also jump on, on the question and, and just share. I've worked in very, very, very large enterprises, and I've worked in small organizations. And even in the largest organizations I've worked in, um, I've had a chance to work for several CHROs and very senior HR leaders, and it was always of the mindset that, you know, if someone decides to leave the organization and it's on that day that we're chasing them out into the parking lot to tell them how much we love them and what we thought of them, shame on us. So whether it's a 100-person company or a 100,000-person company, right, we, we shouldn't be so separated from the process that, that we're not letting people know kind of how we view them or where they stand. And as you're doing this on a more regular basis, maybe using a skills-based approach, incorporating um, tools like AI for kind of, you know, role-based readiness using skills, you're able to have more fruitful development conversations and manager employee conversations even before it reaches a succession planning you know conversation so it increases the transparency it helps with the awareness but also it gives people a little bit more understanding of how they're viewed as well as potential career paths yeah. but you know to kind of put this to a point we want to ask you so i think we do have uh, our next poll question so how deep in your organization do you focus on succession planning?
as we're waiting for that poll to close, another question came in that said, what are the key succession elements that need to be in place? And what are the steps that need to be established? I'm going to massively oversimplify this. Um, there's usually three questions in any succession process that, that I ask. And there's lots of different ways of getting at this. The first question is knowing what you have. What is the talent that exists in our organization? The second question is what do we need? Defining the roles and responsibilities that are going to drive the future of your company. And the third question is how do they align? Where do we have great synergy? Where do we have gaps? So what are we going to do about it, right? Uh, are, we going to, are we going to build and develop? Are we going to need to bring in some, some external talent? The start of a succession process for me is always those three questions. Now, we can have lots of different ways of getting at that information, internal data, external data, technology-driven, conversations that we're having. But those are the three core questions we always need to be looking at, always on, in a modern workforce environment. We've, we've got to understand, and I can't tell you how many people I talk to on a day-to-day -day basis who say, I simply don't know what I have. Right? So we can start really simple. What do you have? What do you need? How do they match up? Sorry, and, back to you. No, no, no. I love, I love those three. And I'll add a quick fourth um, coming from the perspective of Eightfold. Um, you know, Eightfold is a product that talks about skill adjacencies and learnability and capability. So maybe the fourth item I would add there is have we considered everyone? Have we considered everyone that can do this? So if we know what we need and we, we kind of know who we have, have we also considered other people that may not be on the radar? So can we use some type of tool that maybe helps us figure out how, how functions relate and how skills relate and learnability and transferability, especially as the nature of work increasingly takes that shape, right, like your CEO story. So in our results here, it looked like the majority of folks are doing it at the senior executive level. Am I reading that correctly, Maria? Yes, yes. Uh, I'm, yeah, let's see here. Senior, yes, yeah, senior managers, actually. 20% um, are doing it for every employee. That's good. That's better than I expected. Yeah, that's impressive. Way to go. You guys are all um, leading edge. And that's a great transition because our next section is kind of talk about what this means for employees. So this is another chart from our, our eightfold um, survey. And this is at the employee level. And this surveyed um, just under 1,000 um, employees. And it asked them about, you know, um, what does this mean for you? And a key takeaway is employees, you know, want to be in the driver's seat of their career. They want to know what opportunities they have. They want to know how their skills align and map to the organization. And, you know, they, they maybe don't need everything done for them, but they want to know how to potentially do it themselves or where to get that information to kind of plot that course. So this chart comes from that survey, um, and these percentages reflect responses where employees said these items were extremely important or very important. And as you can see here, you know, employees are seeking increased transparency and understanding. As mentioned, they're looking for guided paths, and there can be many. They just want to be able to know how to identify them. And now that they, they are they are available and they know how to get there, you know, how, how do they potentially maybe find mentors along the way or, you know, champions within the organization? And, they, and I think another key piece to this, and this comes from more of the manager-employee relationship, is, you know, a common phrase in, in my experience has always been, you know, we have a system, trust it. People are watching, people are looking, you know, um, you, you, are, you are being um, – acknowledged for the results you're producing. I think employees want to know that if there is a system, you know, what is it? How does it work? What are the rules? Um, so that, in, that increasing approach on process transparency and removing ambiguity is ever so much important, especially as many of you um, are using tools like HCM suites or maybe learning experience platforms that are helping them you know, figure out the training they need to potentially get to that next role. They also need to figure out what are the other organi organizational circumstances and views that will help them get there. Yeah, I, I think what's, what we've really seen in the last year is there is a shift in the power balance at organizations. Organizations held usually more of the knowledge, more of the um, data, right? Um, and, and now that's starting to even out because employees are rightly asking for more clarity and more transparency, as you said, Jason. I mean, I, last week I had two interviews, and the candidates asked both of them specifically how they will progress at Hydric, 
how am I going to learn? How am I going to grow? How would I take on newer, different roles? And, and they also ask that, that for my commitment to this, right? But commitment can't just be talk without action. And so we know these discussions can be hard, talking about people's skills, talking about their gaps, knowing how to provide the opportunity to projects or roles that they want to take on. And so to me, data and technology really build the, what I call the, kind of the bridge of neutrality and transparency in these discussions. Because it can empower our workforce. How long have we talked about, you know, you've got to own your own development. We want to put development in employees' hands. But if you don't know where you stand, and you don't have objective data that helps you define that, and you don't know where the opportunities are, it's pretty hard to do that. Right? So we need to openly communicate, but we need to leverage technology to assist us in this process. And I would argue that this could be a true competitive advantage in this tough labor market, that we are going to um, help you in a, in a more objective way, in a more transparent, in a more consistent and constant way, understand your skills and capabilities and or gaps, map that to what roles are open in the organization or projects we have to work on, and the coming together of that really does empower the employee, really does allow them to take on more, does them allow them to grow, and we all know that we want to retain um, our employees. So I, I think that's the, that's the bridge we have to build, and, and data is at the, at the forefront of doing that. And as we think about you know, the employee experience and moving people through the organization to a point where they reach you know, the top levels of an organization, um, I think internal mobility is the new retention. You know, we're, we, we may not work in the same job for 20 years, 30 years. We'd be lucky if we work in the same job for five. Um, but if you think about this concept of, you know, what's been referred to for a better part of a decade or more, this project-based employment, you know, organizations now have better tools or can go out and acquire better tools to create these kind of internal marketplaces that allow people to move from project to project, developing their skills, developing leadership, leadership capabilities, and, you know, always stay with the same organization's logo on their paycheck. Um, I used to say stay within the same four walls, but we don't even have walls everywhere anymore. But the point of this is, is that, you know, as you get layers down, you need to give people a chance to develop additional skills, maybe beyond the job they're doing today or the role that they're assigned to do today. You also need better tools to track the skills that they have and the skills that they're using, because I can guarantee if everyone thought about the job description for the job they applied for, and how they do their job every day, those two things are very different um, and probably list a very different set of skills. And the other, the other part of it is if you have a more comprehensive approach like, in a, like a talent marketplace that includes not only jobs but projects or events or maybe even volunteering or community events, you can track skills that are gained through those other non-role-related experiences and assignments and then they show up in the in the employee profile so they kind of help inform the complete capability of that individual not just what they did for that specific role or what you know of them i think as our capabilities are getting better as we're collecting more data there's an onus on hr to not only inform people but also track that information and make more informed decisions themselves there's a, there's a question that came in. I, it's a fabulous question that asks, any advice on what not to do <laughs> when it comes to succession planning? Um, I'll start with one simple rule I try to follow, even though it can be very hard in certain instances, uh, and then I'll pass it over to you, Jason. I think one thing we have to really hold ourselves accountable to and it's, is um, to ensure it is not primarily a subjective process. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't have talent review conversations where we're discussing um, our, our employees and our leaders and, and understanding how different people have experienced them. It's not to say that should go away, but if we do not have ob objectivity at the core of those discussions to challenge some of those things, that to me is where succession planning um, goes wrong, and it's what breeds distrust. Um, I very clearly remember running a talent review process with a CEO and senior team of a tech company. And we came to the, there's always one of these in a talent review process. Um, it was a sales leader, and he had hit every, blown away every goal, um, had one of the best revenue drivers they had, um, always can hit or exceed numbers, so he's just, you know, kind of a rock star in that way. But everyone in the room knew he was horrible to people. 
Um, you know, he no one wanted to work with him. No one wanted to. He didn't have any followership. Um, people left the organization because of him. And so this really intense discussion ensued about this particular sales leader and what do we do with him because he performs incredibly well, but oh my gosh, he creates a nightmare for our organization. And um, at one point, the CEO stopped and said, we have core values that I have communicated out to the organization. We have put all these people through assessments so that we've got kind of apples to apples comparisons of, of where they are across performance, potential, um, competencies, right? And we cannot ignore that to make sure that we've got our guarantee to hit a number at the end of a quarter. And I thought that was just one of the more powerful examples of leadership I've ever seen in succession planning because he went back to objective data. You know, we know that this guy is not going to match our values. We know that he, um, we know that when we looked at the capabilities that were most important for this particular organization, he did not score highly of them. And so that became a safe place to say, I know I may be giving something up because of what he drives from a revenue perspective and all that, but we defined what mattered and he doesn't need it. And so we can't let our subjective um, perspectives overcome the objective data that gives us actually a very clear answer on how to move forward. Um, Jason, what, what would you add on what not to do when it comes to succession planning? I'll, I'll add two things and I'll take maybe a different approach. I come at this from a couple different angles. Um, there's, an old piece in, there's an old piece of academic research that studied college dormitories. And stay with me for a minute. Um, the way the research came, uh, was, was focused and the way it came out was it said in college dorms, the people that lived closest to bathrooms and stairwells were the most popular. And why is that? Because everyone passes their room to go do what they need to do to either go down the stairs or go to the bathroom. So it was a matter of proximity. Today's world, we can't just focus on who we know and who's closest to us, especially as you see the image here, hybrid remote work. So I'll go back to the question, did we consider everyone? What criteria are we using that may be able to open up the audience to consider more people? Um, so no longer is it just who sits closest to the sun and who have we had the most exposure to. That's the first one. The second one I would say is um, don't build a plan that's a singular plan. We, we operate in matrixed organizations. We operate on cross-collaborative teams. One of the things that I've learned um, in my experience is sometimes your value to your business unit is not the same as your value to your function. So you have to have these kind of matrixed views of leadership and leadership development because someone's role and their value may, may mean very different things to very different people. So I would always just say, you know, if we, if we operate in matrixed organizations, you should have a more matrixed review on where people fit and where they can go. Thank you for humoring my my dorm example. Great study. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna steal that. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, um, I appreciate everyone um, staying with us for the time here. But these are our key takeaways. You know, a data driven approach is key. You know, advanced technology can support dynamic analysis and insights. But one of the themes running through our discussion today is that you need more and more information to have a more qualitative approach and to incorporate additional data points and market intelligence to, to really drive insights. Um, but also you need to do this more frequently. Um, organizations need to monitor and create opportunities for leaders at every level. Um, a broader view is essential for identifying the most critical roles for the future. And uh, a key one here that I'll share with you is, you know, we, we do a lot of talent insights research. And if you're trying to develop your future leaders, you also need to focus on in your organization, in your industry, what are the emerging skills and what are the skills that are sunsetting and declining. Um, in most organizations, I will probably bet to say, your emerging skills are surfacing where you are not looking. So that's part of the reason why you need to take maybe a deeper view, a more frequent view, and expand the audience. And with that, um, I'd like to thank you all for attending. It's been a pleasure. Um, Marie, I don't know if you have any parting words. I'll, I'll just close with this idea, and it, it gets to the final question that came through, which is how, how do we get buy-in to do this? Um, we believe that this shift to modern mobility for the boardroom, for the CEO, for leadership, for all employees lies at the center of whether a company is ready to step into its larger responsibilities. So the best way to look at how to get buy-in is treat this like any business challenge or issue or problem. Define the ROI. 
set forth the data that shows if we don't do this, this is what's going to happen. You can hold your partners accountable, people at Aidful, people at Hydric, other partners that you work with, hold us accountable to help you build that business case and that ROI. But you've got to build that out, right? The cost of turnover, the expense of trying to hire right now, um, the you know what you lose um, if we don't follow these critical processes because it isn't just a talent initiative that we check the box on. These are the future decisions that impact our organization's ability to grow and succeed. So um, I, that's where that's where I'll leave it. Is is this is not a, a just a people issue. This is an organizational issue, and so we deserve to treat it with that level of of diligence, um, and, uh, and, and you deserve to get the support for it. So we would, we would love to help you with that. So we appreciate you taking the time to attend the webinar today. Um, if you liked what you heard and you enjoyed kind of sitting in on this discussion, I'll just add a quick shameless plug. Um, at Eightfold, we have our own podcast. I happen to be one of the hosts, and we talk to leaders and change agents like Maria all the time um, around how to have tangible, uh, accessible tools to change your organization for the workforce of tomorrow. So appreciate everyone's time and thank you for attending. Thank you.